Yeah. Well, so you must be up here, what, half three or something? Yeah, maybe even The early. alarm goes at 3.15. Wow. I leave the, <laughs> the door at about 3.37. Didn't even know that time existed. Yeah, Devin, I don't yeah. Know. no, I go to bed later than that sometimes. Yeah. Um, but no, it's actually very interesting. And sleep has become a very interesting part of my life. Mm. Um, in fact, you're going to hear an item on it tomorrow. We, a couple of us have been wearing sleep monitors and... Is that it's not, nothing to do with the dream things? No, just no, a completely right. separate thing. Very interested. I'm actually really am interested in sleep. I think it's the great undiscussed yeah. health hazard at work is it's a complete waste disrupted of time. sleep. No, it's not a waste <laughs> of time. I tell you, it's so not a waste. See, everyone <laughs> thinks if, if you can minimise it, you're, you're gaining life. Well, but that, you're not. Isn't you're that rational? Really, That's quite no, it. No, you're no? not. You're giving yourself cancer and Alzheimer's. I mean, the, right. the evidence is really strong. You're, you're doing two things at that time. You're, yeah. you're, you're restoring health, basically, fighting disease. Yeah. And your brain is, is filing. And the, the, just the connection between lack of sleep and uh, lack of memory is right. very obvious to me. I mean, I, I've, I've discovered it since I started the Today program. Yeah. And I'm not at all surprised to find that people who don't sleep get Alzheimer's. And, um, uh, and they've even now found a link between sleeping pills and Alzheimer's. So clearly what the pills are doing, which is operating right. on the same thing that makes you sleep or not. But you, you should hear a bit of this tomorrow. We've got a, a good oh, yeah. sleep scientist, the country's most eminent. Definitely on the iPlayer, obviously. I'm not getting up at sleep. <laughs> Evan Davis, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. When we spoke to your work colleague John Humphreys last month on Chat Politics, he said that there's a substantial rivalry between senior broadcasters at the BBC. Who's your That's biggest rival? Absolute nonsense. There's no rivalry at all. Come on, Evan. None whatsoever. <laughs> Paxman Humphreys, no rivalry there. Me and Justin Webb, no, there's really seriously, there's no there's no rivalry. You know, we we um we're a solid block. We're unified. We we are, we're like brothers of different parents and sisters of different parents. No, we we honestly we love each other. What and was John doing then? Was he being mischievous? He or? was being mischievous. Yeah. There, there, <laughs> there must be just a couple. That's of... old school. That's old school. See, that's that's a different generation. Okay. I think. Yeah. No, we're we're all part of the union of um, BBC presenters. We're one for all and all for one. Yes. Yep. <laughs> are we going to get a lot of this? Um, when you started on the Today programme, some labelled you a lightweight. What does that mean, and do you think it's a problem? Uh, I, mean, I know what they mean, um, and I think there was something in that, and there was, uh, there, there, there was a point to that, and mm. I could see what they meant, which was I came across as less earnest and perhaps more informal, and sometimes more frivolous. And I think that's what they meant often when they okay. said I'm a lightweight. And there were probably certain subject areas where I came across as less knowledgeable and less authoritative, particularly the kind of perhaps the foreign affairs-y stuff. So I can see what they meant. However, I can also see yeah. where they were wrong, which is I think there's a tendency to assume that informal and approachable mm. uh, and maybe friendly is lightweight. And I don't think that is lightweight. I think sometimes if you can give people the impression that you're giving them sugar, but you're giving them fibre, that's it's dumbing up. Yeah. It's actually not dumbing down. It's it's it sounds you're making it sound easier than it is. Mm. And so people think, well, this is lightweight, but actually you're giving them real content. And I, I, I mean, I think more that was more true of my coverage of economics where I was often accused of being lightweight and I think the Mail or a newspaper said it was dumbing down economics but I know that people who knew economics didn't think there was any dumbing down at all it was just trying to make it comprehensible yeah and that that's not lightweight that's heavyweight you yes. know it's good economics in a in an approachable form so I think just because uh, it might sound a bit more informal doesn't mean it's lightweight but I sort of know what they meant and where they were coming mm. from. So that's a bit of the past what about the future are, are there 
any more further ambitions for you in broadcasting or are you at the peak of your career right now? You no, know, it's funny, I, I, I suspect I'm at the peak of my career, aren't I? I can't think where you go Is that a shame? Up. Well, it's funny because it does mean, it, it does slightly change your life outlook when you think, God, actually I can't really go up from this point. I'm not going to be Director General of the BBC and I'm not sure what other broadcast or presenting job I would want other than the one I've got. I'm not, it's not my ambition to now take my presenting to the United States and conquer America right, okay, in the way that okay. a, a rock star might if they've done okay in the yeah. UK. So no, I, I think it probably does plateau. It does affect your life. But that doesn't mean I don't have, you know, projects which I would like to do, ideas for television programmes or projects or books that I might mm. like to write. You know, there's stuff to do. Yeah. So it's not like you lose all your sense of purpose or future, but it does slightly change your outlook on things mm. to think this is probably as good a job as I'm ever going to have. You were live on Radio 4 with James Nochty when he made that unfortunate Freudian mm. slip uh, regarding then Culture Secretary Jeremy Hunt. Are presenters trained in how to deal with live on air mistakes no and actually it was worse than that I actually was live doing the show with Jim but I actually wasn't in the studio when he made the slip I was actually out in another studio recording another interview for right. later in the program and when I came out people were running around and said you never hear what Jim has just done yeah and I said do you think anyone noticed and they said I think they will have noticed <laughs> And then I went back and looked at Twitter and Jim was top yeah. trending item worldwide yeah. and I realised they had noticed and I didn't really know how to play it. No, we don't get training in mm. how to deal with those kinds of issues. Was it fairly exciting for you as you, you because of you, no, you weren't felt, the button? No, I just... felt out of the loop and I didn't, right. so I was then interviewing Jeremy Hunt uh, at ten past eight and I didn't know whether to kind of acknowledge it or to just pretend nothing had yes. happened and we... I, I just thought I'd pretend nothing has happened. Yes, yes. That didn't wash. So by the end of the interview, Jim had felt it was necessary to make some acknowledgement. But your general point is, is are we like a sort of professional mm. organisation where we know how to deal with these things? We've got contingency plans. We've got algorithms we're following, mm. routines. No. These things just happen. It's, it's, it's more, perhaps a bit more chaotic than most people would mm. appreciate. You've shown distaste for the idea of people having an agent. Why don't you need one? Well, by and large, I think I'm overpaid. I have told the BBC that. I tell anybody who, uh, who cares, to, cares to ask. And so if I'm overpaid, I don't think it's reasonable for me to get an agent to try and get more from the is BBC. Is that the sole purpose of an agent, then, do you think, is about Well, salary? not the only purpose, but I don't want an agent to negotiate with the BBC and, incidentally, then to take 10% of the salary or whatever right. it is that I've already earned. So I don't think it would be good value for the, for the BBC. Um, and I don't think it would be particularly good value for me. Uh, and I can't see why the BBC should negotiate with an agent, you know. Hmm. They're my employer. I say, I'm, I'm not going to talk to you. Can you please talk to this other person who's going to take a slice of my salary for the... Yeah, I mean, if I were the BBC, I would say, forget it. Yeah. We'll talk to you, and we're not negotiating with anyone else. And personally, if I was the BBC, I'd say, we're not even negotiating with you. We know that you've got nowhere else to go with your particular <laughs> configuration of skills. Uh, so you're, we're basically your only employer, and we're going to pay you what we pay you. Here it is. Um, then people have agents for other things, like books and... Um, uh, speaking engagements yeah. and the like. I do have yeah, an agent for, 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 for okay. book, okay. book, books. Um, and what about generally, though? I think, do correct me if I'm wrong, but was it that you said that it would be better if 50% of that entire right. sector was... So there was a very specific, a very specific thing, which is around the market for public speaking, mm. where there's a really weird, dysfunctional market of agents who try and sell your services to clients as a public speaker. And you get paid potentially thousands of pounds yeah. for an engagement, and agents go out and try and sell you. And that market is dysfunctional and is over capacity. Okay. And what actually happens is there are lots of agents, um, lots of agents who I've never met, who have nothing to do with me, I've never spoken to, and who advertise my name. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that I is see. not good yeah. because people sometimes might Google me if they want to have me as a speaker. They Google me and assume that these completely anonymous people are agents of mine and they phone the agent who then comes to me and says, would you like a speaking engagement? And I might say yes, and then the agent creams off 15% of see. the fee. So it's that specific activity that utterly, you were referring utterly, to? Okay. Utterly, it's utterly dysfunctional. It is literally people putting it themselves between me and a potential client mm. and charging a toll for that client to get to me and not telling the client, by the way, there's no need to use me to get to that person, just email them at the BBC and you'll get a better chance of getting them anyway. So that is a ludicrous market. I couldn't be more critical of it. I think personally, a law that simply says you're not allowed to advertise someone's name without seeking their permission in advance might be required. You can see why they do it though and why they would defend that. I mean, perhaps you might get opportunities that you wouldn't have got for example, and, and, then, and then they're mm -hmm. able to take some of and that. And if they ask for my permission in advance to advertise my name, that's absolutely fine. Then that's fine. okay, okay. Just, I think it is very easy for them, and I know it has occurred, that they have given the impression that they are my agent, and to get to me, you go through them. I know it because I've spoken to the clients. I said, what, you mean you don't always use them? And I'm, no, I've never met them, I've never mm. spoken to them, and I don't want to use them. And you're paying them 15% for nothing, yeah. for directory yeah. inquiries. You mentioned your salary are the today program presenters are they all paid equally for their role in the program above my pay grade to know how much they're paid <laughs> but i would be amazed if we were paid equally yeah. no i think it's inconceivable we're paid equally they're privately negotiated contracts and no they're not equal i would be amazed not but i don't know what my colleagues get paid no. other than what i well, read about in the newspapers <laughs> occasionally have things I won't go into any further no, into that. Well, just if you know anything, let me know. No, yeah. I'd be love to. I'd love to know. <laughs> um, the Beeb, though, it strongly advises that it never comments on contract issues. Isn't it in the interests of the general public, the taxpayer, though, to know how much of their money is going to you know, I, personalities? I, I'm kind of with you on that. I mean, I think as we are taxpayer funded and as we are of public interest, I think there would be a pretty strong case for the BBC. Um, so we're going to publish them all. Right. Um, we're just going to publish what we pay everybody. Uh, now, in some cases, I think that would strengthen their negotiating position. In some cases, it would weaken their negotiating position. Mm -hmm. I think the BBC fear, as people do when you propose any change, that that would weaken their negotiating position. And. I don't think the BBC's position is ludicrous. There is one sector of this, th this world, of our country, there is one profession yeah. whose salaries are published each year. Yeah. Um, actually, there are a couple, but the one I'm thinking of are chief executives, uh, directors, company directors, mm. whose, whose salaries are published in annual report and accounts. Okay. And I think it is true to say it has been inflationary in that sector. And so you might well say, if you publish salaries, it's harder to resist increases in salaries. And I think that publishing has been, if you like, to the benefit of chief executives, because every company says, well, we just want our executive to be in the top half. And if everybody wants to be in the top half, a little bit of elementary maths tells you you just get into an endless spiral up. Yes. So I can see why the BBC fear it. But I, I actually think it might increase public pressure in in the case of you know broadcast mm. presenters to pull the salaries down and i think that would be you know i think that would be you know no bad thing well it would be good for the public it wouldn't be good for presenters yes, yes, yes. um moving on after just one series so oh, just to say yeah I, just because i think everybody's salary should be published doesn't mean i want to give my salary individually <laughs> it might, i'd be very happy to give mine in the event that they're all published but i would I don't want to be the only one who gives my <laughs> Of course, salary. absolutely. Yeah. Um, after one series, only one series, Simon Woodruff quit Dragon's Den, uh, claiming the show became a battle of egos, not a forum for business innovation. So to what extent does the entertainment side, do you think, dilute the actual content? Of Dragon's Den? Um, 
I don't think Simon. I don't think Simon was as unhappy with it when he was on it as as, as, as those kind of reflections okay, okay. he might have made since. It's a, well, reflect, it, you know, I mean, I, and the story of, of of the changing roles of dragons. You know, the, the need to kind of refresh each series or two with a new dragon. I mean, I, it's 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 sometimes more complicated than of course people flouncing out and wanting to to to, to, to say their bit about how they hate the program. Um, but I look, it's an entertainment programme. It's made by the entertainment department mm. at the BBC. It's not made by the business department. And I think it is a classic example of a programme that mixes fibre and sugar and gives you a balanced diet as a result. Now, you know, there's perhaps more sugar than some people would like as opposed to fibre. But I can tell you there is fibre in that programme. You watch that programme, you get some real business. Mm. And you learn something from that programme. And you, you, we have increased the vocabulary of the UK population in that programme. I remember, as economics editor, we would not use the word equity on the 10 o'clock news. We felt that was just one notch oh, really? too high. I think that word is now in the vocabulary of the nation. I mean. We might have used it on the 10 o'clock news if we explained it. Yeah. But, um, you know, I just think people do not appreciate how much Dragon's Den has taught mm. and has opened up a world, albeit it's a, it's a contrived world. I think most audience know that venture capitalists don't sit in a discarded warehouse yeah. with piles of money in front of them. They know that it's a TV contrivance. Mm. But you do learn something. You see. But you, you, and you are getting real business. I mean, you really are seeing a negotiation in a lot of cases oh, well, and a pitch. I think, who was it? Was it the Sunday Mirror that well, their investigation, no, it's a, you know, they, you say real business, they say, I don't know the exact percentage, but the overwhelming majority of deals reached in the den are then closed or cancelled afterwards. Mm, that's what I mean by it's real business. I mean, it is, you get, you get an exchange in the den, yeah. you get the dragons establishing as much as they can in the den, making a tentative offer. What you're seeing is equivalent to, say, the the offer on a house, which is sort of non-binding, um, subject to subject to you know details. Um, and you know it is it is pretty real. Put it this way: I, I went in not knowing much about reality TV. Right. I was pretty surprised at how real it was. The dragons genuinely put up their own money, which a lot of people don't believe. They is, genuinely is it, is it don't... In, in front of them, is that their own? I'll leave you to make your own guess as oh, to no, whether you think on. the BBC would this have £250,000 sitting in an open forum with lots of people passing through and dozens of technical people and other things. Um, I'll leave you to guess on whether it's actually real money, but it is certainly the dragons' just, real money that they invest in just told me that Santa Claus doesn't exist. So what a shame. <laughs> it is certainly the real money that the dragons put into the businesses. Yeah. And it's certainly the case that the dragons know nothing about the businesses. And it's certainly the case that a lot of them have gone through and a lot of them haven't gone through. Mm. You know, I mean, that much is all very clear. Uh, but it is, I, I think it is, it is really quite a good business programme. And it focuses people on what is the real issue in business, not the, the, the second section of a newspaper with rights issues and mergers and takeovers, but with the only question that matters in business. Can this product be sold to a significant number of people at a price that comfortably exceeds the cost of making it? And that is all that matters. Will it sell mm. is the question in business. Of course, you read the second section of a newspaper, you would never know that. But that is the fundamental question. And that's the question that gets addressed in Dragon's Den. And of course, it's gr brilliant in that it's a, a question that actually you don't need a business degree to frame an informed view on. Because yeah. basically, everybody who watches the programme is thinking, would I buy that product for that price? You know, and that's why it's such a great programme. It sort of democratises yeah. the Yeah, oh, absolutely. Idea. What, what's the future of the programme and your role within it? Well, you know, since the pilot, I just thought, well, this programme has got a life of maybe one series and, you know, that'll be fun. And then the second series, well, up to series 12 now. And I, I, I don't know what the future of the programme is. It, it, it chunders along fairly comfortably. <laughs> oh, yeah. And 
you know, I expect one day it'll wear out or be past its prime or, 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 or beyond plateauing. But, you know, as long as they're still making it and want me to do it, I'm, com I'm comfortable doing it. Mm. And lastly, on, on Dragon's Den, why is Deborah Meaden your favourite dragon? Deborah's, um, Deborah's very grounded, actually. She's very, uh, she's very grounded. She's very, although it always looks in the den as though she's a rather, you know, fearsome dragon, she's actually a very easy person to talk to and to work something through with. Is it a persona that she puts on? No, bit? I think it's... Is I it mean, the editors? I think it's, I think it's just perhaps the, 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 the forum brings out that more of that side of her. Um, maybe there's a bit of editing, maybe it's a bit of her, but I, I don't, you know, I think it's just, just turns out that way. Maybe people look for that in her yeah. when they're watching the programme. There's a bit of viewer editing going on. But, you know, my, my own view is, is that if you want a kind of person you can sit down with, have a discussion about something, Deborah's probably the one to go with. But they're all pretty good in their mm. own way, you know. I, I wouldn't want to exaggerate uh, the qualities of Deborah versus the other. They all bring something to it. Yeah. You've been ranked by The Independent on Sunday mm -hmm. as the most influential gay figure in British society. So do you That was once. I think I'm down to number well, 12 now. That was 2006. But yeah, yeah, that was 2000. But you no, it was 2008, you know, wasn't it? Was it 2008? I think it was after I got the Today programme okay. job. I think it was after Today. Um, and it's just been one downhill, downhill <laughs> run since well, then. Well, look, you're still up there, Evan. My question is, do you, do you feel like you have influence? I mean, how? That's always the problem with that independent pink list, uh, is that it's not clear what it's measuring. So I'm not clear what it's measuring. I don't feel I have a huge amount of influence, but I, one of the things I like about our society yep. is that nobody is really in control. David Cameron would be probably the best candidate for someone who's in charge, right? Um, but I'm quite sure that he doesn't feel like he's in control. He has his back benches to worry about. He has his coalition partners to worry about. He has the public to worry about. So everybody in their job, everybody in their job in this country, pretty well everybody, feels like they have constraints, limits, rules, people who they have to please and satisfy mm. or they'll lose their job. And, and I feel exactly the same. I mean, I. I couldn't. I can have a little bit of influence by doing a good interview, yes. uh, exposing something as untrue, mm. or making a point that is unappreciated. All of that, brilliant. But I can't just pop on air and say what I want because that's not what I'm paid to do. And if I did it once, I might get away with it. <laughs> if I did it too often, I would be replaced. And that's why I don't feel it's you have that much influence. I think the media has a lot of influence, but you take any individual person in it, they don't have much yeah. influence. The cabinet has influence, but no individual person. You know, it's just a, life is a crisscrossing mesh, fine grade mesh yeah. of different pe centers of power and different routes of accountability to that power. And I know that there's a sense, a really strong sense among some people that there's us and there's them. There's the elite who exercise too yeah. much influence, yeah. and then there's the ordinary person who is somehow the victim of a conspiracy against them. But all I could say is, I don't think it feels like that to the people who are in that supposed elite. They feel like they're running around <laughs> trying to kind of keep up with the different interests. So life is a complicated mesh rather than a, a simple battle of a kind of power and a and a, uh, an ordinary victim. And I, I, I think it's important for people to understand that, that when we talk of power, yeah. Rupert Murdoch, the city, mm. the politicians, the toffs who come out of private schools, the Guardian, the thing is that you're seeing that these bits of power are holding each other to account, which is why none of them feel that powerful. Rupert Murdoch is held to account by the Guardian David Cameron is held to account by Rupert Murdoch, or maybe a little bit of The Guardian and Rupert Murdoch. So there's a sort of, it always just turns out to be a little more complicated than the mm. conspiracies would have it. Mm. What did you make of 
the whole controversy surrounding the introduction of gay marriage. Well, the introduction of you know, the, the legalisation of, of Well, gay I think marriage. it's very interesting because, I mean, obviously, I, BBC person, I can have no opinion okay. on gay marriage. Uh, no professional opinion. Mm. Does that no, mean no, you can... No public opinion. My okay. husband can, you know, and yeah. he's obviously very much in favour, and, yeah. and I'm civilly partnered, so I'm, you know, yeah. to uh, be clear and open about that. But I... Um, I think we're in the midst of a very interesting period of major cultural change. Mm. And it's partly a generational thing. It's partly a, uh, uh, if you like, a kind of extension of the 1960s and everything that went on with sexual liberation at that time. I think it's partly another stage on from civil liberties and uh, changing roles, for yeah. changing views of people of different ethnic origin and uh, different gender. But I think we're at a very interesting juncture and we're testing a very extreme change in, in attitudes towards a very important issue. And in the course of my adult life, life, not even in the course of my lifetime, in the course of my adult lifetime, the change has been so marked that I would say it's you know, my partner and I sit and just go, wow, it's yeah. just unbelievable. Gay marriage was inconceivable when I was a young adult. I mean, it just was not even conceivable. It became conceivable in the 1990s, uh, uh, but, you know, in the 80s, just wouldn't have, wouldn't have crossed anybody's, uh, anybody's mind, really, to think of it as coming. And so, it, no, it is a big thing. And I think what you're seeing at the moment, I think this is the most interesting thing going on at the moment. What you're seeing is a culture war between people who are comfortable with that and other things that go with it, um, tolerance of all sorts of things, a culture war between that and people who are frankly a bit discombobulated by it and feel they're not keeping up and don't quite understand all the processes that are going on. and maybe people of faith or people of other value systems that find all of this bewildering, distasteful, a step too far, uh, and who perhaps think, you know, a line needs to be drawn and it all needs to be stopped. But I think we are, so I think we are in the midst of a bit of a culture war over it. And, uh, but I think we are seeing people who you would have expected, you know, people of an older generation, who you might have expected to be very resistant to gay marriage, yeah. turning out to find when they see gay people getting married, doesn't, the world doesn't implode, we don't have more storms and, 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 and God doesn't punish us. I'm thinking, gosh, maybe it's okay. Mm. So it's, it's, uh, I think we're seeing quite a big transfer from people who found it inconceivable uh, uh, and distasteful to people who think it's normal. And um, that is a very big change, really. Mm. Huge change, I think. Yeah, yeah. Particularly for gay people, mm. obviously. And just on a penultimate theme, um, as BBC economics editor, for, was it over six years, I think? Yeah, it was over six yeah. years, yeah. There's yeah, no seven. better person then to pop this, this to. Why do we tax work and labour? Why not, why not reduce national insurance contributions, get more people into work, tax environmental pollution, other bad activity, that would make the country more economically pos uh, prosperous. Uh, it, 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 it could do. Um, I mean, the truth is, <laughs> that you, you probably want to identify environmental bads, right? Pollution, emissions uh, are the two obvious ones, and you probably want to tax them. You probably don't want to tax them into the dust, because we, we could tax, for example, carbon emissions into the dust tomorrow if we wanted to, so we'd have no carbon mm. emissions, but then we would have no energy and we would be a misfunctioning society. And in particular, lots of work and stuff that relies on carbon would then be pushed offshore and wouldn't be performed here. So you'd, you've got to be measured about these things. Now, I think if you priced all the carbon bads, all the environmental bads in our society, I think it's unlikely you would get enough tax revenue in to replace all the income taxes and other taxes that we know and love. So there may be limits to how far you can push that. Mm. But I think most people would think, most people would think, look, 
rather tax bad things like environmental pollution than tax good things. I just, I, 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 would, I would hesitate to think you can tax those mm. and replace income tax. I just think you, you want to be careful about being too clever here. You know, you can, you can say let's tax bads and that can just end up being an excuse for going too far in taxing things. Mm. And you have the danger of just wiping out stuff which your country needs and which you have to do. And then so you, you clearly, you, you don't want to wipe out manufacturing, do you? We can't afford it, we don't want to do that. And you're not going to save the world by doing that because it's going to move offshore. Penultimately, your interview with Sir David Attenborough last year saw the natural history legend dramatically cut off, I think, as he grappled with your question about euthanasia. Some suggest Actually, his line dropped, and, and um, honestly, people felt it was a conspiracy okay. because I asked him about euthanasia. He has a particular interest in... Um, I, I don't think I use the word euthanasia. No, he no. has a particular interest in population control uh, and very much fertility control. And I was asking him, and he's a very elderly man now, obviously, I yeah. asked him whether end-of-life issues around end of life and whether we might have, people might have more control over yeah. their end of life was, was an issue he would give them much thought to. I think I was trying to broach it in a very tactful way. I think it was a pertinent, interesting question yes. for a guy who talks a lot about population. Um, and darn me, the line dropped just as, 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 and I'm told that was not to do with me asking the no, question. No, no, no. Mm. But why did some people speculate that well, it might have been a producer intervening or something? Well, Sir I David don't know, because his... people do, because it had got to a particular, we lined drop all the darn time on the Today <laughs> programme. I don't know why, it just seems to happen. When I'm on the phone, very rarely does a line drop, and on landline at least. On the, uh, today they drop all the time. So I asked him the question, and just as it was getting interesting, <laughs> the line dropped, which did obviously lead people to suggest yeah. that the, the line dropping wasn't coincidence. What makes a question uh, generally considered acceptable, in contrast to one that might be viewed as outrageous? Yeah, unacceptable. Partly, I think, tone does matter. Right. So I think you can sometimes get away with questions um, if they're asked in a cheeky chappy sort of way mm. that you might not get away with if they were too earnest. Uh, I think it's, I think most of the questions people worry about are questions on issues of social taboo. Um, so questions on race and such like you need to be careful with, I think, because we, we know these are issues of great social sensitivity and you don't want to overstep a mark or say something inappropriate. So that's one section. And the other are those where I think the audience feels, or the audience would be right to feel, that you are intruding into someone's private affairs too far without their, without their consent. So as an interviewer, interestingly, and, and Justin, my colleague, has made this point sometimes, it is important, if you're being personal with someone, to make clear to the audience, via this person, how far they are willing to, to share. Okay. So you can say, for example, in an interview where you're getting very personal with someone, you could say something of the form, I know you've been happy to talk about, you know, female genital mutilation mm. uh, in your own case. Do you feel that coming onto a program like this and talking about it is useful to getting a greater understanding of it? If you said that to someone, then the audience knows that if you ask about FGM, yes, yes. that you've got the, hello, we've got a little dog here. Hello, Mr. <laughs> you're getting tired, uh, bored. You, the audience would know yes. that 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 you're not intruding that the person is if you like okay with it and i think i think if you ask something about a very sensitive or personal issue without the audience knowing that the, the subject of the interview is 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 willing to receive that question then yeah. it can yeah. be awkward what proportion of your questions are written for you by researchers and uh, virtually none i mean so we often all, you're we, doing we there are doing we get we get a kind of we do, get, we do get why we're doing the interview on a brief. So I, w I don't want to pretend that presenters 
do everything. We get a brief on each topic we do. It'll say what the person is expected to say, why we're doing it, and it might have some suggested questions. Yes. But by and large, what the presenters do is they think of the questions they're going to ask and they write the words that they say. So that is more or less the role yes. of the presenters. That's what we're paid to do. And lastly, what is the best thing about being Evan Davis and what's the worst? Best thing about being Evan Davis? Um, do you know, it's just a very, very lifestyle. Uh, you get a lot of attention, yep. which human beings are programmed generally to like. Uh, so a very lifestyle in which you get people saying nice things and horrible things, but you know, you get, you, you get people noticing you, which is, which is nice actually, and treating you nicely. People yeah. treating you as special, even if they hate you. So that's the nice thing. What's the worst? That's, that's just getting up at 3.15 in the morning and forcing yourself, and I'm actually a moderate night person rather than morning person, getting up in the morning and um, forcing to get your brain into gear and get on air by 6 a.m. Yes. when your job starts. Well, if the, if the worst thing is, you know, waking up, then <laughs> that's rather wonderful, isn't it? Evan Davis, thank you so much. Thank I really you appreciate much. your time. Thanks, thank Oscar. you very much. Thank you. Cheers.